Hey, what's going on, guys? This is Brian and Jack from Superman's Comics, and this, of course, is That Bolo Show. We're talking about the new comic book day releases. We're talking about this first appearances. We're talking about reader buzz and variant buzz. But before we get into the list, we want to make sure that you guys know time is running out to get those pre-orders in for those exclusive t-shirts, right, Jack? That's right. Those two limited edition Simple Men's Comics t-shirts are available right now on simplemenscomics.com forward slash swag. You can get that Bolo Club, G.I. Joe, New Japan Pro Wrestling Bullet Club t-shirt, or you can get that Chamber of Chills and Masters of the Universe He-Man t-shirt. Both are available for a limited time, and once the pre-order period is over, we will no longer be offering those for sale. Yes. Once the, order, once the window closes, the shirts are gone for good. So get your orders in now at simplementscomics.com forward slash swag. Link is in the description. But pretty heavy new comic book day this week, huh, Jack? Yeah. You know, one that maybe on the outset I wouldn't have thought was that big as far as number of releases. There were some major ones. But honestly, I think there's some uh, books that crept onto the list late that I'm almost more excited to talk about than the no-brainer obvious picks. Yeah, it looks like there might be some of the six-round picks that might turn out to be the gem of the draft. Right. But either way, we're going to get into the list right now, right? Start with those first appearances. Yeah, yeah. Let's start right there. Then the first appearance we're going to talk about this week, we've talked about it before on Last Call. This didn't sneak up on anyone. We're talking about that Magnificent Miss Marvel number 13 with the first appearance of Amulet, right? Right. We knew this one was going to have buzz. Uh, you know, it was kind of like right on the back of Storm Ranger. We found out that Amulet was coming out pre-FOC. Um, and, you know, when we started the last call show, there was a lot of talk about, which as I think has died down as kind of time has proven what we believe, that the market is larger than individualized YouTube channels and things like that. Um, but there was a belief that we may damage the market by talking about things pre-FOC. And, and we'll, what we contested is it isn't actually um, individuals like us talking about a book and giving our opinion. It's when Marvel gives you direct facts or DC or any major publisher. And that's what we got is we got direct facts uh, straight from the creative team that this character was coming. So that allowed everybody to prepare for it. Having said that, the demand right now is so strong in the market. Uh, People are looking for the next big thing. Flipping comic books is extremely popular right now. Um, and we're seeing that time and time again. Uh, I'm really surprised that this was a book that you could actually sell over a cover price. But the pre-orders were strong on this one. Um, and it seems to be a book that's selling out everywhere. Yeah, I left this one on the shelf. But we've talked about this before. I'm just not a big Miss Marvel fan. But either way... You are seeing people out there. There's buzz about it. Pretty much every comic book website had information about this character leading up to it. So it definitely had people looking for it on release day, which was yesterday. Then the next first appearance we're going to talk about is Swordmaster number nine. We got what? First appearance of Fang's brother? Yeah, and I'm not real uh, familiar. I, I, I read the Agents of Atlas uh, mini uh, I did not go into the individual series. So I'm not real familiar, but there's a lot of buzz kind of slowly growing on Swordmaster. It's funny when, you know, the Agents of Atlas stuff came out. We talked about, Brian, we, you and I are both the big advocates that $5 first appearance, you know, you get multiple uh, added to a market that we know Marvel wants to play on cinematically. And we have enough experience in this to know that when Marvel gets involved cinematically, that's when the secondary market dollars come into play. Uh, and it's funny how, like I said, Wave caught kind of that first bit of attention, attractive female character, uh, Filipino descent. There's a large Filipino community in America, comic book fans. Doesn't surprise me. Now we're seeing Swordmaster kind of get some of that attention. I, I think that's interesting. And I wonder if that will kind of play throughout I also think that those uh, future fights things have done well for a lot of the individual characters. So now we're starting to see as they world build because there's been so many of these first issues that have first appearances. It'll be, it'll be interesting because I know this is going to sound silly, but if we were to project 50 years into the future, Brian, if Swordmaster is Daredevil, if we're talking about that level of a character, 
this entire early run of of these issues have contained minor first appearances that would one day become major if you had the opportunity to get in on the ground floor of a character you know that back in the silver age man that would be amazing that's kind of this kind of stuff you dream about so you got to kind of project so i don't blame anybody who's stocking up on these uh first appearance from these agents of atlas kind of related characters sword masters in specific yeah i agree especially about the 50 years from now thing the only difference is silver age comics he didn't have people you didn't have people collecting to collect trying to keep stuff in pristine con- condition it was absolutely the donny kate style in the back of the pocket or yeah. read it and leave it or let your friends borrow it but i mean who knows that's what's great about comics is you don't know what's going to happen with it but then the next one we're going to talk about this week is black panther agents of wakanda number seven right so here we're talking about uh you know, the Legion of Foom. So we've got like Fing Fang Foom and kind of like a dragon team. So we're taking one team book and we got a first appearance of another team. Obviously this isn't something, it, it, I don't read this book, but I imagine this kind of sounds cool and interesting. Um, but as far as like investable, I would say no. But as far as something that'd be kind of cool and interesting to read, I think that, you know, there's some intrigue there at least. And also, didn't we just get news recently that Ta-Nehisi Coates' run's getting ready to end on Black Panther? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's getting ready to wrap that up. Then the last one for first appearances this week is that Strange Academy number one. This is a book when we talked on last call. I was kind of not laughing it off, but I didn't have much interest. And since we talked about it from last call to now, I'm actually interested in this. I picked it up. haven't read it yet. But to be honest, I picked it up more to let my older son read it. But since I got it and kind of thumbed through it a little bit, I may just read this one myself. Yeah. Um, so these are the kind of books that I like. I easily, in full disclosure, could have put this book in as the long-term play of the week. There's probably a lot of people that that's kind of the route that they would go. And I can't blame anybody. You're talking about uh, numerous first appearances. Um, I, w- I want to say shout out to uh, Key Collector Comics app, who I'm going to use to source the first appearances. But you're looking at uh, Emily Bright, uh, uh, Doyle, Dormammu. So obviously that, you know, the son of Dormammu, you're talking about the illegitimate son, it says. First appearance of Shaylee Moonpedal. First appearance of Zoe Laveau, uh, Calvin Morse, and Desi. So you have a cast of characters. And we talk often, when you heard us talk about it with Agents of Atlas, granted those were more superhero characters, but you've heard us talk and say, you know, if you're looking at a book that's 4 or $5 and you're getting multiple first appearances, it's kind of a an easy bet, right? You know, you, you've got so many different opportunities for that book to take off. Um, and especially in the day and age where so many writers are doing that, like Donnie Cates look back where you're trying to pull from obscure source material but also marvel this is some sort of initiative by them and they're trying to i think broaden the doctor strange brand and they're trying to get a younger audience the only thing i would caution is we saw this with dc comics with the gotham academy books where we got introduced to a whole bunch of younger gotham city characters and the gotham academy lumberjanes crossover yeah nothing ever really came from that stuff um, doesn't mean it couldn't, doesn't mean it couldn't, but you know, we haven't seen anything pan out. And there were a lot of people who felt exactly the way they feel about Strange Academy with the Gotham Academy book, because there were so many young characters and they, you know, there were so many opportunities for, for, you know, these, one of these characters to spike. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. I like the J. Scott Campbell cover that has a lot of the first appearing characters right on the cover plus it's j scott campbell um so you know that's going to naturally obviously give you another market because you're able to play into his completionist and so on and so forth but there's there's a number of variants um and i've seen people kind of like dig different ones so it's kind of a buy what you like sort of thing my wife saw it and she read the solicit and she was interested because she liked the Disney show or movies, that, The Descendants, and thought it was yeah. like the Marvel version of The Descendants, so she was yeah. interested in reading it. It's, that's not that far off. But, so that's going to wrap up the first appearance section for us. Let us know. Did you guys pick any of these books up? Did you read them? What did you think about it? 
But in the meantime, we're going to move right on into the Reader Buzz section. Then the first one coming up on the Reader Buzz probably had the biggest buzz of the week. And we're talking about that Batman number 90, right? This is supposed to be also like what they're calling the first full appearance of the designer. So, yeah, so there were a couple comments on the bullet list asking about that. And again, if you've watched, you've heard us say, we really try to stay away from talking about a book as a first appearance more than once. Number one, because it devalues what is a first appearance. And you, you do that and you immediately get the other question of, well, you did it last week or last month. You know, were you steering me in the wrong direction then? And really, in, in truth, it doesn't matter what I or Brian say. We, we're not the ones who decide what's a, a first full or a cameo. Lord knows that. The, the market ends up deciding that. So what ends up happening is because other sources um, label this book a first full, they list it as a first full, then you start hearing that like kind of um, snowball effect of people kind of calling it or expecting it to be called that way. Um, and that's what ends up happening. Now, do I think it's the first full appearance of designer? No, I think that his appearance in the first book would be uh, Batman 89 would be suffice. But again, I'm in the minority on the way. That's, I view that's a quarter third cameo. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you know, it's just not. But either way, I didn't expect this book to take off the way that it did. I really think it's like residual heat from um, coming off of everything with Punchline and, and the kind of the real demand that we saw. We just talked about um, Three Up, Three Down, Tinian's Run on Batman being really hot right now. And, and that's really what I'm drawing on there is the fact that I find it hard to believe that this book would be this popular just based on the designer. Um, not like if I like that character, it looks cool, you know, no doubt, but we've seen that before. Uh, I really think this is coming on the heels of Punchline. There is speculator flipper collector every audience is is kind of honed in paying attention to this batman run and i think we could see a run of issues do well right up until the point we hit issue 92 when those foc orders are going to catch up with that demand and we're going to start seeing some of the over orders and the books will be readily available yeah and then the next one on the reader buzz this is one book that i, I read and I actually really enjoyed it king of nowhere number one and i will say one thing that we're getting into con season, right? We had a C2E2, Emerald City's coming up. There's a bunch of other cons coming up. Um, if you look back to last year when some of these boom books came out and they had those boom panels at these conventions, you kind of want to make sure you go to those conventions because a lot of times they're handing out exclusive variants for this. And I believe King of Nowhere might be in some of those panels, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, and in, this is one of those books where they kind of like tease this one uh in advance and in, it has less buzz on it than some of the other ones there was some debate about this on the on the uh bullet list ig post because somebody said that they felt very strong about this book because of boom's track record which is just a testament to what boom's been able to accomplish that now a collector who is looking at the market as it is now or is new coming into it they look at boom and say man their track record you got to jump on those number ones that reminds me a lot, Brian, of when you and I got into the game in Image Comics. That's really the way we started to view the releases. Now, not every release pans out right off the bat. It's funny, though, how many of the releases from back in our day that didn't pan out and we were down on are now coming around to being optioned and picked up for movies and starting to get second life on, on the secondary market. And that's the world we live in where Hollywood is in a constant state of... Uh, FOMO trying to get the next great comic property that's going to uh, make that money on some streaming service or on the big or small screen. So, you know, this one, less, uh, kind of like less buzz, but still based on reputation alone, people were, were checking this out. And it has that kind of Grass Kings look because again, it comes from Tyler Jenkins, the artist behind Grass Kings. So it has like that natural kind of, he's, he's building an art style. I think that you have those certain artists where you look at and you know who it is. Uh, I kind of think he's going to head down that road. Yeah, I definitely enjoyed the first issue. So I'd recommend it. Just pick it up, give it a read, but moving on into the next one on the reader buzz, we got that new crow number one book. Yeah. So this book is really, let's be honest. I, 
So I Each Momoko driven. Yeah, I do a lot with IDW. I sell a lot of IDW books. I flip IDW variants frequently. That's one of, been a specialty of mine for a couple of years now, at least. Um, the Crow is one of my medium level books. Like you can make money on them. You can you you know you can do well, but it doesn't sell with the same level of demand as some other properties. It's got, it's got a strong fan base, but just I think it's a smaller fan base. Yeah, so that just tells you basically how often your books are going to sell. So they'll sell, you'll make money, it's just going to take you longer. But yeah, especially is, that 1 in 25 variant for that. But this is different. This is selling fa- at a much faster rate than I'm accustomed to seeing. And it's f- even the incentives, which aren't Peach Momoku based, and I think it's just, again, the heat rubbing off from people are paying attention to this book because of the Peach Momoku cover. I think that got people to look at this book. And then once they're looking at it, then their investor brain or speculator brain or flipper brain kicks in and they go, well, I should get the highest ratio variant of this book. So this has been more successful than the last several um, Crow miniseries that IDW's put out as far as immediate secondary market demand. Yeah, I think exactly what you said. Uh, um, Peach Momoko, as we got to would say, is so hot right now, right? And then they see the Peach Momoko. Some people like if they're doing pre orders, they like DCBS, like the way I used to do. I used to search almost by my favorite artists at the time to see if they had any covers coming out. And if Peach Momoko is one of them, they're going to see the Crow book. Then they might look further and they say, oh, there's the cover B, then there's also what the Tim Seeley variant and then the one in 25 variant by the artist. I'm not going to butcher the name. I remember in the last call, you were kind of hoping that they made, instead of the Tim Seeley, the one in 10, they made the Momoko like a one in 10, but either way, it's sold out a lot of places online right now. I, I didn't buy this book. Um, I like Crow the movie, just not Crow the comic book, but either way, like you said, it's definitely had reader buzz behind it. Yeah, I would say and, artist buzz. And I would say keep an eye out because this isn't a one issue burn and turn. The entire uh, mini series is going to have Peach Momoko doing the covers. So there could be attention paid throughout the series. It'll be interesting to see do orders go up for issue two because stores ran at a deficit for issue number one um, and then drop drastically in issue three. Or will we see the typical 50% quantity drop from issue one to issue two? Right, and then I think almost just as hot as Peach right now, you got Mirka Andolfo, and she's got that new book from Image out this week in Mercy Number 1. Not very often you see an Image book with, what, five different covers on it? Yeah, and I would say she's not as hot as Peach Momoku, but she's, like, on the coattails. It, it's really, I think we're in the midst of this kind of female artist movement that we're seeing. Um, we're seeing a number of them really kind of come and get um, – major mainstream attention and i there's it there's something a little less creepy about women drawing women than some of the um the men drawing women especially like if you're at a convention like you see at adam, uh, adam hughes and stuff like that it is it's a little less uh tongue all out <laughs> it's, it's a little less uh creepy but um but yeah so i am not surprised this series was popular i think the amount of covers there's some great covers obviously and that like steampunk steampunk type yeah any it's not, dreadful it's not my type of series to get excited about some of the accounts though that i follow some of the people that i talk to in the comic community very excited for this release so um this is one of those ones where not for me but totally expected this to be popular pre-ordered some copies because i you know i'm gonna go ahead and throw this one to image number one you never know. Uh, Mirka and Dolphus is getting increasingly popular. She could get one of those kind of like first look type deals for her properties. Um, so I think I think now's the time to be bullish with her because she's not just a great artist, but a creator, uh, somebody who's building a portfolio of IP. Um, but this one, I think the only downfall is the number of covers. There's so many covers. We've talked about that with Image Series. Well, you can of- toss out the cosplay variant. No one's going to buy that. 
you can toss that out. You can not count the blank. But regardless, anytime you have so many choices. It there's an art germ in there. And there's a bunch of store exclusives. And that's what I was going to get at. And then a bunch of stores jumped on the exclusive game with this book. And I think you're going to see that consistently, Brian, with Merck and Dolphy's releases. I think anytime that she's putting out a project, you're going to see retailers jump on board because they've seen returns on that. And Image is one of the lighter requirements as far as like what companies will require uh, of a retailer as far as minimum copy requirements. So you, you can do a smaller print run, uh, more kind of, kind of cost efficient. Yeah, because like the bigger ones, like Marvel's what, uh, Automatic 3000 to do an exclusive? Automatic three thousand. Even if you don't have to pay anything with art, you're you're starting at at six thousand dollars right there, or slightly below because you're going to get a better than fifty percent discount. But if that's on a four dollar cover price book. If it's more, it's more. Then the last one for the reader buzz this week was one of those big ones out of DC with those decade variants, and we're talking about that monumental flash hitting seven hundred and fifty issues. A lot of great covers on this one. This one to me is awesome. We've talked about this before. It's like, find the cover you like. For me, I actually bought a couple of different covers on this one because I, one, I'm a huge Flash fan. I mean, uh, Josh Williamson's work has been fantastic. I've said it since Rebirth that Flash has been one of my favorite books. But yeah, I picked up about four different covers. Yeah, see, I'm right with you, Brian. Now, we've talked about this before. I'm unapologetic about this. I love these prestige format DC um, kind of compilation issues where we're celebrating these monumental moments. I am totally cool with taking a one issue break from like the traditional storylines and celebrating the greatness of these characters. I would have no issue with Marvel doing it. I think DC has handled it perfectly. It's funny how everyone complained when they began about those decade variants. And I, you and I talked about this. People were just looking at it wrong. Everybody was looking at it from a secondary market perspective. Oh, you know, the books are getting overordered. You can't make money. Well, they're getting overordered, and I don't think overordered. They're getting ordered heavily, like Wonder Woman said. Well, here's the thing also. There's more to the hobby than you just making money. How about right. just That's enjoy the, the read? Wonder Woman 750 was one of the most, if not the most, ordered book that month because it's such a monumental issue. You have to think, if I'm a comic shop owner, that's a book I don't mind having on my wall two weeks after release because it's a big issue. People are always going to – want that issue if you're a wonder woman fan how do you not have that issue in your collection um yes there's a multitude of covers but i think dc has done an amazing job doing two things number one curating this program by having cover artists who are exceptional and then also having the actual art that they're producing really sell the decade i mean it, it you look at these covers and you're like yep i get it and i'm with you every one that's come out my struggle on release day is to limit the number of covers that I'm buying yeah. because I always start out by saying when they I'm first just gonna get, get this one. And then yeah, I when, get, they, when they first get shown, yeah, there's always like two. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, I'm gonna get this that one. one and that one. Yeah, and then I get in front of the, the, the rack and I'm like, ooh, that one looks kind of good too. Yeah, exactly. So the three that I was real high on with this one, I'm a little more boring, a little more modern, were the Delato the Matina and then the red blank is my number one. That yeah. That's why we're we're so good. <laughs> I yeah. did the same. <laughs> <laughs> really? That's, yeah. that's funny. I was really just gonna get the blank and the Matina. And then yeah. I saw the Del Auto and I was like, ooh, I kinda like that. Yeah. It's not it wasn't the best Del Auto, but it's not you don't get Del Auto DC very often. So and when you do it tends to be like store variant type. And he's so done I a couple was, good flash ones since I've been yes. in this rebirth, like the cover yeah. B Del Auto. Yep. So, so yeah, I grabbed that one. And the red one I'm the most excited about, I want, I want a reverse flash sketch cover. Uh, I was already kind of thinking about how, how I wanted to go about that one. So I, that's the one I'm, we've talked about that, DC doing it right with the cover price um, blank, albeit at an elevated cover price because the book is uh, higher than a re regular retail. So that wraps up the reader buzz section and we're gonna roll right into the variant buzz. First, one I want to talk about in the variant buzz section is I gotta admit I fully overlooked this, and this is a fantastic book. When I first saw it on the list, I was like, "What are you talking about, Kiss Zombies?" And then I saw it, I was like, "Whoa!" And it's a great homage to 
that golden age pre-code horror, pre-code crime, whatever you want to type book. But we're talking about Kiss Zombies number four. Right. Just, that, you know, I'm not the biggest golden age person, right? I don't have that level. I've always said that's my weakness right now in the hobby, the area that I want to do as much learning as possible. Um, but this is one when I was looking through covers, when I was getting ready to put my orders in, I was like, man, I think I'm going to order this book. And I felt stupid, Brian. When I'm ordering the book, I'm sitting there like, it's Kiss. <laughs> but, but at the same point, I, I based it on the fact that this is the homage to this you know, iconic pre-code horror um, cover that is really hot on the market right now. People are chasing this. We saw it. You know, we talked about it. We saw it with our buddy, Andy Tomberla. I saw it firsthand last year at Heroes Con. He bought his first Golden Age book, and he was like a junkie, hooked, and then that was it. Indie comics be damned. He was all about the the the, the pre-code horror. And uh, um, we, we've seen this homage before with Marvel. Wolver they did it with Wolverine. It was popular. So I knew that this one would be printed in a smaller quantity. Um, I'm not surprised it's interesting. Now, we're not talking about big money, but – with shipping, the few times that this has been available on eBay, it's gone for about twelve to thirteen dollars, so a few dollars over cover price. But I think that's really solid on a Dynamite book day one. And this is a book that I think, when you look at Dynamite, Dynamite's a lot like IDW or Boom, where when you give their books time, they dry up and disappear on the market. You very well could have a book that down the road is a 20 or $30 book. I have no doubt. And we're, this isn't the only book. We're going to talk about a couple more that kind of fit into this category on this list. This was a very um, homage heavy list this week. Yeah. And I think really this Kiss Zombies, unless people are looking forward or looking through all the titles, it's yeah. often overlooked, especially people that are golden age fans that don't want to deal with modern I mean, you got that perfect, I mean, almost to the T homage to that, was it, Crime Suspense Stories 22. I got the cover up here as yep. well to go so you can see it with the variants. But, yeah. And, and one more thing to note about that, too, is even harder. I don't like it as far as look as much, but even harder to find is going to be there was a, I don't think it was announced, but a one in seven incentive black and white version of this. Cover. Yeah, and we got the cover up here on the screen right now as well. So, yeah, so that's I think that one is going to be um, could be even more down the road. Uh, you know, it's already going double double ratio. So either way, not a Kiss Zombie fan, but yeah, I love the cover on this book. So I'm glad you put it on the bolo list because I probably wouldn't even freaking looked at it. The next one we're talking about right now is. That Doctor Who 13th season number two, and this is the Peepoy variant, right? Right. This is this is Doctor Who, the 13th Doctor, season two, number three, the Andrew Peepoy variant. Now, Andrew Peepoy, a lot of people may be familiar with for a lot of his work with Archie Comics. Um, he's done a lot of kind of risque, kind of like the popular women covers. Yeah, the Archie Afterlife variants were awesome. Yeah, yeah, real popular. Um, Brian and I actually met him at Baltimore Comic Con and he showed us actually some of the original art and how it got kind of uh, censored and changed um, before he was able to release it through Archie. Um, but here we get that cool Captain America homage. And this is another one where, you know, you're coming out of, I believe, Titan Comics. You're talking about a, a smaller print run. Um, Doctor Who has its fan base, not for me. Not but it, it, again, I respect fan bases. Um, this is kind of a weird one, right? Because it's the it's season two, so it's essentially volume two of the Thirteenth Doctor, which I believe is the current one, the the female one. But I'm I'm not even one hundred percent sure about that. Um, but again, it, because it's got this cool homage, it'll play into both worlds, and, and uh, people who see it, who are Captain America fans, are going to connect with it. It's the famous punching Hitler cover. Um, and that each about an iconic cover that's been there's been homage plenty, but I like these ones where they're coming out of left field, like the old Dark Horse, um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Tomb of Dracula number ten. Uh, you know that that's when it's like you, you wouldn't expect to see that, and then in a book that's printed so low and so tough to get, it, it's kind of cool. So this is another one to grab and stash that I think 
um, you very well could be sitting on a book that two, three years from now, nobody's got any listed on eBay. You throw it up for 20, 30 bucks. Somebody's been waiting for six months for that. You know, when you've got that book on your wish list and you're waiting for it to pop up and it just won't. And then when it does, you almost don't care about the price. Yeah. And then the next one we're talking about is another homage. And this is one title that I was just interested in reading. So I was glad I was pre-ordered this. And we're talking about Sumerian Queen of the Black Coast number one. And this is the Action Comics homage, right? Yeah, and this one I think more people saw coming. This is coming from Ablaze Comics. Um, people, they this cover specifically was heavily solicited. It was heavily talked about. Um, so maybe not the immediate secondary market um, book. But what's interesting about this is, again, this is a series that was previously shut down due to a cease and desist. Um, is now able to continue. Again, we're talking about uh, Robert E. Howard's kind of like Conan universe. Um, this is a public domain story, so there's nothing that Robert E. Howard's estate or Marvel and Disney can do about a Blaze publishing this, and this is what we've talked about. This is the future of comics, guys. We're going to have to get used to seeing things like this happen with some iconic properties very soon. But, um, yeah, so I'm interested in this because, you know, I – I'd like the Conan stuff through uh, Marvel. It's worth at least checking out to see, um, you know, what is going on with this. And then again, you get that hedged bet of having that homage cover. That's always going to be in demand with Superman fans. There's people who collect all um, homages to that specific action comics, number one. So honestly, those were three of the coolest releases to me this week, Brian, was those three, uh, those three homage covers that I think, um, I don't think as many people were paying attention to those because of all of the hype around the obvious. And I've said this before on the channel, guys, I'm a long-term, when it comes to reselling books, I'm long-term. And these are the types of books I like to pay attention to, the books that maybe they play in a smaller, um, you know, a smaller fan base, but rabid, they'll always be looking for them. Um, and you're going to have less competition. Plus some of those books you're talking about flipping them or reselling even long-term, but even also you got to think of those are the type of books that sell better at conventions versus yep. online. Yeah. Yeah. A lot, a lot of times we've talked about that too, selling live. Um, when, when you're in person and you, that person has been looking for that book, um, you'd be surprised. Uh, a lot of times like Ninja Turtles, I'll sell a ton of, ton of Ninja Turtles books um, live at a convention, but they'll sell slower okay. online. And you got a better profit margin because you're not paying for shipping. You're not paying for shipping materials and all that stuff. So, but moving on to the variant buzz, the next one we're talking about is that 2020 rescue number one. This is that gorgeous regular price Jen Partel variant. Yeah. There's a number of regular priced variants on the list this week, Brian, which is a kind of a bucked trend um, from the typical incentives that dominate the variant buzz section of the list. But that's why a lot of these we're not talking about immediate flips. A lot of these you're not going to make money on immediately. A lot of them are honestly PC buys. I think that's where this fits in. This is a, if you're a fan of Jen Bartel, if you're a Jen Bartel completionist, um, and again, cover art completionists are one of the only forms of completionists we're still seeing on the market. You're not seeing character completionists anymore. That's gotten too crazy. Um, so cover art is one of the, uh, cover artists is one of the last remaining categories of completionists. So this is going to be probably a smaller print run book than a lot of Jen Bartel's other books could have long-term value, but it's really a PC pickup for most because you're right. It's a stunning cover. Then next we have Conan Serpent Crown number two, but this is that John Tyler Christopher variant. There's some other variants for it. I see why you put this on the list because out of the other variants, this was actually my favorite as well. Yeah. So a lot of people originally were posting the incentive. There was a late push to this book. And I think it's due to the fact that I don't think this book got heavily ordered. So it sold out very quickly at almost every place that I saw that listed it. Um, this was out. And I, if you've seen the cover, I know we've got the cover up on the screen. It's stunning. It's stunning in person. And it's uh, not an action figure variant. Yeah. And, but see, one thing I like about John Tyler Christopher is every cover that he does always has some sort of theme, right? It's not just like, boom, here's awesome cover art. The way that he does act, the action figure covers, he's kind of like the perfect man to do those covers. And here you kind of have that back. This, this is all about the backdrop with kind of the neon lights. 
Um, and he really plays that off extremely well. The covers to me is the standout cover uh, of the three. And it's the one that got the late buzz and then the sellout. Um, does it mean that it will be a better secondary market play over the incentive? I'm not sure. Um, neither of them may be great plays, but it we certainly got more late buzz than the, than any other cover. I don't see. I mean, I, I like it because it's just a gorgeous cover. But if you're talking about from that value wise, to me that Conan Serpent Crown, in my opinion, the story hasn't been as good. Mm. Usually, story helps drive value for those incentive variants. But well, and and Ben Caldwell is a um, great artist. He's yeah. been you know doing work for a long time. He's got a fun style, but honestly, he's never been an artist who has been able to connect that second. Then the next one I'm talking about is that Star Wars Rise of Kylo Ren number one, third print, staying with that Clayton Crane, but it's got like that almost gray, I don't want to say black and white, but like the grayish background. Yeah, they've been terrible with these Kylo Ren variants. Um, really How does that make you feel, Jack? Uh, you know, I don't understand why Marvel can't do everything across the board the same way. Um, if you're killing it with your traditional Marvel releases, if I've seen other Star Wars second prints and third prints, they've done the right thing with the cover. I don't understand the punt completely on this, where we've gone back to like these 2015 color changes. Um, still, still. Uh, Kyler Wren right now may be one of the top five hottest comic book characters in all of the market, as crazy as that sounds. Um, his current series, every issue, is not only selling out, but you know, going 10, 12, $13. Um, there's spikes in back issues. Readers are reading into everything, trying to predict backstory, predict what back issues are important. Um, it, there's a real buzz there and it's starting to trickle down to other things. And we've talked about this since our coverage of like, you know, certain hot lists that we talked about the fact that really there's a niche market for these Star Wars variants. And I know this is a later print, but it's still in the variant section because it is a variant cover. Um, it's really here for a reader buzz uh, selection. I think that this is for the people that really that missed out on this, um, maybe wanted to read this and didn't want to wait till trade, wanted to read the floppies. Maybe you picked up issue two and three and you were missing one. Um, this is an opportunity for that. Um, because again, these color change variants have never consistently shown that they're going to do anything on the secondary market. Yeah, I think also a lot of that popularity, like you said, is people wanting to go back in for that backstory, especially since it's the backstory that they didn't get watching the movies. Mm -hmm. So they were able to go back and read some of this in these books and pick some of that up. Um, that's a big reason why I started picking it up, and I've been vocal. I love that Kylo Ren series. But and I know I'm going to piss Star Wars people off, but you didn't get yet. Don't you can't you can't give up. We still have Disney Plus. They, they don't. They've never told the Star Wars story linearly. They're, they've jumped time multiple times. So have faith. Yeah. I mean, look. Even Clone Wars isn't even linear. Right. It jumps all over the place, and that's just in one spot of time. But either way, still a great series. If you haven't been reading Kylo Ren, I highly recommend. It. It's a fantastic read. And the trade paperback, I think, comes out in April or May. I got a pre-order on Amazon. But next one we're talking about, I will say one thing on this list is it's kind of Conan universe heavy this week. And we're going to talk about that Car Dark Agnes number two. This is what, the Anacleto variant? Yeah, and this is a, another one where there was a shift because attention immediately went to the Stephanie Hans variant. The Stephanie Hans variant did very well for number one. We've talked about this on the channel. As long as I've been studying the speculation of comics and the and flipping of comics, I've also been studying the habits of speculators. And they have a tendency um, to try to repeat a process almost until it doesn't work. And you see that with the old school football coach. I know you can make a Joe Gibbs reference where you'll run a play. Counter tray. <laughs> you, you run a play until the defense stops you, right? Um, I don't subscribe to that theory of investing. Um, I think you have to know when to get out. Um, 
the Stephanie Hans variant is essentially a. It's actually the cover A, isn't it? I think Stephanie Hans is doing the cover A's for him. Yeah, I think there's a there's a variant. Um, okay. Like there's a, the Han variant. It's a I think it's a B cover, and it's like a. Um, it's kind of like a grass grass labyrinth of yeah. maze, um, and it's you know, there's nothing about that that's marketable. As great as an artist um, as she is, that doesn't showcase that. Versus the Anacleto variant. Now, Jay Anacleto is somebody is it almost a victim of the retail exclusive market. The retail exclusive market can make you. Um, we've seen it with Shannon Mayer. We've seen it with Francesco Matina. Um, we've seen it with uh, Lucio Perillo and a num- Peach Momoko, a number of them. With him, he's been consistently with Unknown Comics for a long time. Unknown Comics pumps out a lot of books and they put out a lot of Jay Anacleto variants. And I think that that has sort of watered down the, his variants. Having said that, we haven't gotten a lot direct straight Marvel, if any. Um, so people are familiar with him. So he has a name because Lord knows unknown comics is going to market the crap out of, out of those books. Yeah. He uh, reminds me a lot. Um, Giuseppe common Cole is another one I really like. That's mm-hmm. kind of in that same. A lot of potential. I could see getting hot at some point. Um, so there, this is one where the Hans variant had the immediate attention, the Hans cover, and then it switched to the Anacleto variant late towards towards new release All right and with that that's gonna wrap us up for the variant buzz section this week so real quick before we get into the long-term play like we said before go ahead and comment let us know what books you guys picked up this week what did you enjoy reading what was your favorite book for this week what was on what did you like that didn't make the list let us know that's how the list gets made right Absolutely. The list is made up of what you guys are buzzing about on social media, what you guys are talking about. Um, and as you can see, and as we've talked about, it is a living list. I started literally on the previous new comic book day. Next week's list is already in production. And as you guys talk, post, um, as things get, get put on social media, um, it affects the list and the list grows over the course of the week. Right. And also one more thing. If you weren't aware, we did drop that first episode of our new podcast, Simple Men's Comics and Friends, where we have guest panelists on the show. We're talking different topics. We're talking current events. We're talking all things comics, and that is going to be our flagship audio podcast. We will have the video up here on YouTube as well. But if you can, please subscribe at Simple Men's Comics Podcast. Wherever your audio podcasts are found, we do have episode number two that's going to be dropping next week, right? Yeah, really excited about that. We've got some fire topics. Hopefully we have some nice debate. Um, And uh, again, we want to hear from you guys in the comments section, what you think about all of the hottest topics in comic books and pop culture going on today. Right. With that being said, we're going to roll now into Jack's long-term play of the week. This is a book that we talked about on the last call. We were both excited about it for you. You've had a chance to read it. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. But we're talking about Strange Adventures number one. Now, why was this your long-term play this week, Jack? So, like I said, speculators like to follow patterns. Guess what? Um, That includes me sometimes. And uh, this is a pattern that I was willing to place a bet on um, because I don't like to go necessarily where everyone's going. Um, and I didn't see as strong a buzz on this, and I think the market may be making a mistake. Um, you also didn't see a strong buzz when, like, Miracle Man first came out. Or... Exactly. This, it feels very reminiscent of Miracle Man or the Vision series, um, where there really wasn't a strong buzz coming in. Tom King is taking a character who is – I know there was a time when Adam Strange was as big as they get, but now is essentially a D-list character, if that. Um, and he's able to tell a story involving Adam Strange where he can kind of go wherever he wants to go with it. Um, he can kind of do his thing. He can tell it at his pace. He's also with Miss Gerards, who is his um, kind of like perfect compatible uh, artist writer combo. Tom King's stories tend to be heavily like emotion driven and it's hard to describe, but Mitch Gerards just has an art style that I think really plays well into that. You can, 
from from how he draws facial expressions to the way you kind of get the feeling of the ambiance of of the panel um you kind of you're able to translate that emotion well um so them working together i think is an absolute you know it, it's it's a duo that when you see it in a solicit it's going to get your attention now i've never read an adam strange comic i know literally nothing about adam strange my only knowledge of adam strange is seeing him on the um, Krypton TV show from the sci-fi. That was it. Um, so I enjoy going into comics where I don't have this preconceived notion of a character. I don't have these kind of, um, you know, I'm not judgmental, right? I'm ready to just receive the information. Now I joked with Brian and said, I felt really stupid reading this comic because there's two different artists doing art in the book on the interior art. And every time each artist is doing a different time period. Um, one, you're looking back at Adam's past. You're seeing like what makes him Adam Strange. And you're seeing an event and a battle that's going to shape the current story. And then when you have Mr. Gerard's art, you get you see what's going on kind of current time. It took me half the book to realize this, and I had to go back and start over again. Now, again, that's just me being a dummy. Maybe you picked up on it right like that. But I like that kind of stuff, right? It felt very cinematic to me when I was reading. It felt like a TV show, um, the way they went about telling the story. Uh, and it, very much like Tom King's first issues, not a lot happens, but a lot happens. Um, so in the first issue, we get to see this battle. Um, we know that there was this battle that made Adam Strange. He's kind of an aging superhero at this point, and he's signing autographs. And you get to see all of the different types of fans that come up to him from like the overly adoring, the guy who wants to sign 10 books, um, which I'm sure Tom King can relate to because I'm that guy at the convention, um, to, uh, you know, the guy who's cursing him out saying, I know what you did in that battle. Um, then there's an element of mystery because something happens to that guy. And obviously Adam Strange now becomes a suspect in that. And where I got really blown off guard, and this is a spoiler to everybody, is I'm reading this book and I'm totally enthralled in this like sci-fi story, right? And um, I kind of forgot that I'm reading a DC comic, right? I'm like 75% of the way through this comic and Batman shows up. And kind of like I nerd, nerded out for like a, a brief moment. I was like, oh man, Batman's in this. And, uh, and then, then I started to think, oh yeah, Tom King gets to write Batman again. And, uh, and Tom King wins, but you know, it was, it was really cool. At the end, we get Mr. Terrific. Um, it's a mystery. All we know at the end of the first issue is the setup. And then it hypes me up as a reader to read the next issue. And you may sit here and go, but this is a long-term speculation play or a long-term investment. What do I care about whether you liked it? Well, either of those previous series that have become major and specifically miracle man um which have become major secondary market successes were built on the back of reader buzz they did not have hype like brian said pre-release pre they didn't have the largest um print number they weren't the smallest but they didn't have the largest they didn't sell out immediately day one they took some time um you probably slept on it on your LCS shelf. You probably went to your LCS at some point and saw Mr. Miracle number one sitting on your shelf and didn't think to yourself at that time that that you were looking at, well, at one point would be like a $40 raw book. Um, I think this book has potential. I think we've seen DC and Warner Brothers have interest in Adam Strange as a character, whether it's a TV show or movie. Um, I think they want to push him. I think he gives them kind of like a, a real sci-fi character that lets them play in that genre. Um, and I think that this series is going to do a good job educating people like me who, who really, are, this is the first time I'm sitting down reading um, Adam Strange. And then I am excited for Strange Adventures number two. I think they did a great job with number one. This is a DC black label release. It, if you were at all on the fence or like, eh, it's everything that you expect from a DC Black Label release. It's got dark moments. It's got action. It's got um, amazing art, high quality book, a cool variant cover, but I like cover A better. Um, it, it's one to pay attention to. It's one to be on the lookout for. And it's my long-term play of the week. And I think it's one that is going to grow over time. So 
may not see those immediate gains, but again, that's what this segment's for. This is all about a book that, you know, you might be overlooking today uh, and tomorrow you may wish you picked up for cover price. So if you overlooked it on New Comic Book Day, you may want to give it a, a second try and at least read it before you go deciding whether or not you want to make any sort of investment on multiple copies. Yeah, and if you are living around Maryland, this Saturday, March 7th, Third Eye Comics in Annapolis has a Tom King signing for Strange Adventures. But with that being said, that's the long-term play. And that's the bolo list for this week. Again, make sure you guys comment. Let us know what your thoughts, your favorite books for the week, your favorite reads, books that weren't on the list. I will tell you one book that wasn't in the reader bug, buzz list that I liked, and I'm pretty sure Jack liked, and we talked about it on this channel last night with the creator, Jay Sandlin, Mad Cave just released Hellfighter Quinn. If you like blood sport, if you like fantasy, and if you like just some good old beat em up, definitely check out Hellfighter Quinn, right? Yeah, Hellfighter Quinn's a great book. Um, I wish more people were talking about it. Uh, it's a book that I think is going to grow over time. And again, those Mad Cave print runs are small. Talk to your LCS, see if they can get uh, some ordered into your store. If not, Check the Mad Cave store. They will usually have uh, both the physical copies and at least you can figure out where to go get that uh, digital copy. I know it's on Comixology. Uh, so definitely be on the lookout for that. And if you're curious about what the book is about, make sure you check out that video because we, 15 minutes, we talked to Jay Sandlin, the author of that book, all about it. Fantastic. So check out Hellfighter Quinn. And again, we have that second episode of Simple Man's Comics and Friends coming out next week. Be on the lookout for that. Make sure you subscribe, hit that bell notification so you'll be notified when all those videos drop. With that being said, this is Brian Jack for Simple Man's Comics. See you guys in the next video.